So good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us tonight for Moments in Time with Eli Reed and Jamel Shabazz. My name is Janelle Ajani. I am the curator of Jamel Shabazz's Peace of the Queen, a retrospective that reflects 45 years of Shabazz centering the lives of black and brown women and children. And it's currently on view here in Austin, Texas at the George Washington Carver Museum. I wanna take a moment to thank Yaki Smith, Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Moody College for suggesting that we bring Eli and Jamel together in conversation, as well as Dr. Kathleen McElroy at the School of Journalism and Media for her support and co-hosting this event. We are recording our program this evening and we will be uploading it in the near future for those who are unable to attend or who would like to watch again. After our conversation tonight, we are looking forward to a brief Q&A and during that time, if you have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat below and pray for my strength maybe in my timekeeping ability um, as we have a lot of information to cover this evening. So right now, I'll just go into introducing our speakers. Okay, so um, Eli Reed is an accomplished photographer that began his career as a freelancer in 1970. His work from El Salvador, Guatemala and other Central American countries attracted the attention of Magnum Photos in 1982 where he became a full member in 1988. Reed has authored several books, including Beirut, City of Regrets, Black in America, The Lost Boys of Sedan, and Eli Reed, A Long Walk Home, and an award-winning retrospective. Numerous photographs of his have been recognized in shows and exhibitions, and Reed photographed the effects of poverty on America's children for a film documentary called Porous in the Land of Plenty, narrated by Maya Angelou. He went on to work as a stills and specials photographer for motion pictures. Reed has worked with such major films as Roadwood, Too Fast, Too Furious, Poetic Justice, Five Heartbeats, Ghosts of Mississippi, The Jackal, and One True Thing, among many others. Reed has received many awards and achievements, including the Pulitzer Prize nominee. Oh, he was a Pulitzer Prize nominee, excuse me. Harvard University Neiman Fellow, W. Eugene Smith Grant in Documentary Photography, the Michael Medal of Excellence, World Image Award of Fine Art Photography and World Press Photo Award. Reed lately received the National Press Photographers Association, Joseph A. Sprague Memorial Award, the Gordon Parks Choice of Weapons Award, and the IF Stone Medal for Journalistic Independence. Recently retired from his position as a clinical professor of photojournalism at the University of Texas in Austin since 2005, Eli is currently writing and and working on photography book projects, along with planning an exhibition in Seoul, Korea, scheduled for 22-23. He's also working on an ongoing fictional feature and documentary film production projects. Our next speaker, Jamel Shabazz, is an internationally recognized photographer whose work spans over four decades. He is best known for his iconic images from 1980s of New York City, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, Jamel Shabazz picked up his first camera at the age of 15 and began documenting his community inspired by the work of photographers such as Leonard Freed, James Van Der Zee, and Gordon Parks. Shabazz's portraits underscored joy, family, community, and spaces of self-presentation. In every instance, Shabazz aims in his words to represent individuals and communities with honor and dignity. His work has been featured in numerous solo group exhibitions nationally and internationally, including exhibitions at the Brooklyn Museum, the J. Paul Getty Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, Paris Photo, Newark Museum, Art Basel, New ba Miami, the Student Museum in Harlem, Duke University, among many others. These exhibitions have been accompanied by several celebrated publications, including Pieces of a Man, Sights in the City, Back in the Days, A Time Before Crack, and Seconds of My Life. His work is also included of the, in the permanent collections of the Whitney Museum of American Art, the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., the Bronx Museum of the Arts, and the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. In 2018, Shabazz was honored with the 2018 Gordon Parks Foundation Award, and most recently, as of last week, he received the 2022 Gordon Parks Foundation Shaito Book Prize. His works are included in the permanent collections of the Whitney Museum and the American Art, and I just read that, but that's okay. All right, so we'll go right into speaking with our speakers. Um, please turn your cameras on, gentlemen. Looking forward to this conversation. Hey. Awesome. All right. Yeah, so we're here. And, you know, Eli and Jamel, um, it's really a special moment to have the both of you here. Just thank you so much. 
And in preparation for this talk, um, I realized that outside of my affinity for your work, um, what I truly admire about the both of you is your humility and your deep care and concern for people. And I think these are truly the elements that make you both great image bankers. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I wanna start just by asking you to describe the very first photograph that you ever made. Oh, which one? <laughs> the very first one. <laughs> okay. Well, well, for me, the first picture I ever made was of my mother in front of a Christmas tree when I was 10 years old. And uh, unfortunately, don't have the, the um, family, you know, books that they put together have, have disappeared in time. Uh, somebody was supposed to be taking care of it, but that didn't happen. And, uh, but that was the, the first photograph that really, uh, we lost Eli for a little bit. Mm. What, you lost, it? lost me for a second? You're back. Okay. Well, you know, the, uh, the first picture I made was on front of a Christmas tree. And um, what happened was that, that I was looking through a viewfinder that was very difficult to see through. But, you know, that's sort of fascinating when I saw the first picture, you know, from the drugstore or wherever we got it from, you know, when I got it back. And that was, that was the first photograph. And, and for me, the first photograph I made was back in 1975 of, of three of my good friends at that time. Uh, it actually wasn't the, the first, it might have been the second, because the first one, I was new to the camera, and I look at the negative now, and my thumb was in front of the lens, so I really jacked that one up, because I didn't know at that point, so that's probably the first one that I actually messed up until I was able to really understand uh, how to hold the camera properly, but the, the, one of the better ones that came out was on that same roll of film, and it was three of my good friends, and I think subconsciously I learned how to Whole subjects based off looking at a lot of album covers back in the days because that's where I was introduced to a lot of photography early on. So I had three of my friends, Rodney, Dennis, and uh, and Mondo. And whatever reason, I had this vision to, to have them, to shoot them low. I, I got on my back and I shot them on this concrete beam. And, you know, with this image, it's, it's perfectly framed in the skies in the background. It was tightly composed. And that was really one of the, the images that stayed with me and, and inspired me to want to be a photographer so I could do this because it just wasn't a straight photo. I put a little bit of creativity in it and got on my back. And as Eli said, back in those days, you would take your stuff to a local drugstore and get the film process. And that particular image was taken with my mother's camera that actually got me started in photography. You know, my father was a professional photographer. He had the 35 millimeter, the Nikons, the medium formats. But my mother had these, these inexpensive, Kodak Instamatic camera. She had both a 110 and a 126. I borrowed her 126, which produced a square type image and she always had film in it. And I, 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 take, I took it and I started photographing my friends. And that was probably one of my very best photographs that I have to this very day that I treasure because it shows multiculturalism. And at the same time, it showed you where my head was at as a 15 year old kid. Mm. And so, Jamel, you just recently mentioned your father and um, also just inspiration a little bit earlier. I know the book, uh, Litter Freed's Black and White America from 1968 was a great inspiration to you, both you and Eli. So I wanted to start with Eli and ask him, you know, what did it mean to you to be able to write the forward of the 2020 edition of this book? Well, the, the, uh, the book Black and White America was, was so amazing because it was seeing things uh, seeing black folk in a way that I hadn't seen before. It was like really honest and just going with the flow. And uh, are we still there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what, what happened is uh, it's just, he was in the spirit of it. And um, when I finally met him, you know, he was uh, just a real person, you know, and I, I had bought two of those books, two of the black and uh, black and white America books, both of them disappeared. Um, <laughs> That was not uh, fun. But uh, then when I met him, he was everything that I thought he would be, you know, and he's just he has a sense of humor. He was a sense of life. And wherever he went, he photographed with honesty. You know, he wasn't he wasn't playing around, you know. And uh, in fact, the last thing, one of the last things he photographed was, uh, was a revolution in over Europe. I can't remember the name of the country, was, but I, that was the best stuff I saw of all the other photographers. And he was just doing 50 millimeter lens. I like mm. it. Just just going there and doing it. You know, and when uh, the book uh, was coming out, his wife and and the uh, I guess the editor uh, approached me, they called me up, 
asked me to write uh, uh, what I, you know, what I wrote. I mean, I just, I didn't tell him what to write. I just, you know, this was something to appreciate who he was and what he was. And um, that was, it, it was actually so easy because, you know, I got to know him, you know, and, and you know, hang out and stuff like that. And he, and he, he, was, he was really special and without, without nonsense. He really went out there to, to do serious work. Mm. Jamel, um, this image in the middle, we were talking about um, this particular image and why it was special to you. Um, can you talk, can you share more about that? Yes, with all honesty, both images really impacted me as a young child. What's very interesting about the image on the left, the cover of the new version of the book is called Muscle Boy from what Bridget Free told me, his wife. And what that does to me, it, it, it was a reflection of me in the community in which I came from. And that's what really grabbed me initially because I'm looking at children that look like me and around maybe just a little bit older than me. But yeah, I was able to identify with photographs that weren't in my family photo album. So when I saw Muscle Boy, I saw myself. And what the book did for me psychologically, it gave me muscles. It gave me superpower, mm -hmm. you know, to be creative. You know, it, it allowed me to be a visionary. So when I look at that particular photograph, it really resonates with me. Now with the photograph on, on the right, we must have justice. That really resonated with me too in so many ways because not only is it the statement of the newspaper, but it's everything that's going around. And in that image, I saw the power of, of composition and visual storytelling. And I'm looking at this now as a, as a young boy between the ages of eight and nine years old. And I wanna know what does that mean? What does the statement we mean? We must have justice, what's going on? As I analyzed this photograph more clearly, I saw a police dog being sucked on a, a black man. And it, it, it allowed me to see racism in America. And I started to put it together that something is going on in America. And here you have this, this African-American man, you know, he's, the, he's, he's standing out because he's the only black person in the street. And then you have the woman above. So my mind is going to say this power in imagery. And it's just something about this photograph that made me just fall in love with photography and visual storytelling. And I wanted to just see more. What's so profound about it today is how this whole thing has come full circle. I never met Bridget, uh, I never let, met Leonard Free. Whatever reason, the, the book was signed on my father's coffee table, center stage. My father had a vast library, but whatever reason, the book was signed on our coffee table, almost like my father wanted me to read it. He had no idea that during that time period, I was going for that book practically every single day. You know, this is the version that we had in the house that was signed. And, and not only was I looking at the photographs, but I was reading it. I was looking at language that I was not familiar with. I saw the word nigger for the very first time in writing. And I remember as a young child having to go get the dictionary because it was a vocabulary that was all new to me. Lynching, racism, discrimination, a rape. All those words were in the book because the book was actually a diary of Lennox's experience. But what brought everything full circle for, to me, many years later, I had an opportunity to meet Bridget Free at her home in Garrison, New York. And I told her the impact that this one book had on my life. We became very good friends. Here I am, an African-American man, having a relationship, a friendship, a sincere friendship with a German woman. I've been in her house numerous times. And on my birthday last year, as a gift, she gave me the original copy of this photograph, an 8 by 10 signed image that was used for the book. And for me, that brought everything full circle. So when I look at the book, it helped to inform my career. It became like the roadmap that helped guide me on my path today. And now to own that particular photograph that I saw back when I was just eight years old and to have it now at this stage in my life, Again, it brought everything full circle and it allowed me to know that I was on this path for a reason. And another in interesting point, which I must say, Lennon and I went to the same high school. We lived in the same neighborhood decades apart. He went to Samuel J. Tillman High School in the 1940s. I went in the 1970s. The same neighborhood that I documented in my work back in the days was the same exact neighborhood that he grew up in. So it's just amazing how everything has come full circle based off this one particular book. Wow, that's amazing, that's amazing. In addition to um, Leonard Freed, can you both talk about other photographers that have inspired you along your journey? Oh, you know, it, it's uh, interesting because, um, you know, Gordon Parks is probably the first photographer like anybody else, uh, you know, that's going to be going to get influenced by what he's doing. And it was, to me, amazing what he was doing overseas also, you know, the, the 
still your was like the beat of life. That's what he was doing. And, and what he was, uh, not not just the photography, but the art. I, I went to art school. I, I was able to really get into photography, uh, uh, except for being an elective in the last, uh, the last year. And that was a little sort of breakthrough because when I, you know, the first camera I had was, you know, that I had myself was a, uh, what's a, a, a camera 104, Kodak 104 model. And I was trying to take time exposures of the moon, which of course couldn't do mm. with that. And so I, I got a medium, I got a, a medium uh, format camera, Rashika uh, mat uh, camera, and uh, it just like it was like sort of a, a a hands, a big bunch of hands just drove me to to re checking out photography. Now, I, I used to read everything I get hold of, including War and Peace. When I was like mm. ten years old, I went to the library. I heard about this great book, War and Peace, and librarian must have thought I was either crazy or didn't know what I was talking about. She sent me toward the section that uh, law books, you know, that was um, more in peace. Mm. Okay. Right. Uh, but so, you know, everything has been like um, music reading of seeing and seeing photo annuals that were uh, that have, it, it, I think it's modern photography, popular photography, uh, uh, 35 have, they have these annual uh, magazines. Mm. And that's, uh, that was one thing. And, I mean, whatever I could get my hands on and then paying attention. I lived, we, uh, my family, we moved to Per Fanboy. Uh, the next door neighbor was uh, the president of the, the NAACP in Per Fanboy. And uh, we weren't in these big houses. This is like, a, you know, two uh, floors and very simple. And that, that building's still there in Per Fanboy. Um, but, you know, just being, seeing what was going on on the television and hearing the news, what's going on in the civil rights movement. Um, and here I'm next door, you know. You know, a lot of stuff was going on. Now a lot of stuff is going on now. Now you learn a few things, like particularly things that happen at the beginning of a century and, and where it goes to. And we're sort of in that, that space now, but just observing quietly like when i was in war zones and doing stories i i was quiet as hell <laughs> i mean quite hell inside because i wanted to experience and hear everything i took it very seriously i wasn't there to look for awards or nothing i was trying to understand the world as it is um there's a a, a priest who wrote a book the uh, seven story mountain he was a death uh, you know uh well, well, you know, he's one of those guys. So the reason, and he, what he, the first page in there was, says, I came into the world, a child of God, loving him and yet hating him at the same time. That makes the world a very complicated place. And, and it, from just viewing um, all these things going on, and I kept on coming back to Gordon Parks was traveling. He was doing stuff, really interesting stuff that, that said something. And I wanted to do work that meant something. You know, I wanted to do work that would stand to, you know, the, the passage of history that would, you know, and, and you're gathering evidence also. You're gathering evidence. Evidence is not always presented to you. You know, like, I love this picture that did too. We must have justice because it takes so much, takes you into so many deep places, like, as, as you said. And um, I wanted to make interesting images. And yet I didn't know how to make interesting images, but I, I knew I wanted to do it. And the only way you can get someplace sometimes is just, work at it. You can't expect, uh, you know, that's just going to hit you in the head. And, and that's, that's what happens. But I also ran to a great mentor who helped guide me. At one point, I wanted to go to Vietnam. I wanted to document what was going on to see for myself what was happening. And he talked me into not doing that. He said, there's a bigger, he said, there's a bigger war at home. And I asked mm -hmm. him, what do you mean by that? He says, what's So um, it, that's, I've probably gone all over the place just telling you this stuff. But, uh, but that was a, you know, Gordon Parks is always in the back, in, in the back of my head, always saying, reaching out, going further, not, not just settling for something. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's, that's been my guidepost. And it doesn't help if you're talking about it, you're not doing it sometimes. You know, there's a, a, a Nobel Prize winning 
uh, writer who, who said he talked away 10 novels, which uh, I thought was interesting. But it's a, it's a good point to that. Do it. Don't talk about it sometimes. You know, well, you know, you know, what I'm talking about, you know, you know, you got to yes. do work. You have to do the work and talking about it doesn't necessarily help. You can waste a lot of time doing that. You got to figure out for yourself what you want to do. That's right. And, and to that point, like, I, I, the, you know, my inspiration came early on as a young child because I came up in the 1960s and the war in Vietnam was going on. And, and I wanted to know more about the war. And my father, you know, for whatever reason, his library was full of books from war, all the wars that was going on. I think the, the, one of the first photographs I sort of really captivated me was a photograph of Robert Kappa, uh, June 6, 1944, during the D-Day invasion. And uh, Robert Kappa, of course, you know, a, you know, a magnet photographer. And that image just really captivated me because I watched a lot of war movies coming up, you know. And so this gave me a gauge into the war itself, but also those that are documented. At the same time, I was one that had such a love for knowledge. I was always, I found myself spending a lot of time looking at Life magazine as a young child. You know, I was fascinated with life. And that gave me a gauge into a, a, a broader life outside my community. When I think about life today, life was our internet. You know, we look at what the internet does. Life Magazine did that for me as a young child. It allowed me to see what was going on in America and what was going on around the world, but mainly the war in Vietnam. And that stayed with me. And that developed my profound love for the library, looking for more images. But what I would see with my father, he was bringing home photo magazines every week. Uh, he had a subscription to Playboy magazine. And he had, again, a number of books on war. And one of the books that really impacted me early on was a book by a renowned photographer that my father had a coffee table book by, Philip Jones Griffin. And Philip Jones Griffin comes from the United Kingdom. He's a war photographer. And it's through his book that I developed a greater understanding on the current wars that were going on around the world. You know, and this one book showed me that we were living in a world of conflict. And I was introduced to the conflict that was going on in Belfast. Uh, I was introduced to the, to the, to the war in, in, in Uganda at that time and Vietnam. And I'm, I'm, I'm studying it, I'm reading it, and, and, and my desire to want to know more is just, it's just there. And I just kept going through all of my father's books. I eventually got introduced to the work of Eve Arnold and this incredible female photographer that documented uh, Malcolm X back in the day. So it was something about that visual language of photography by photographers that just had me going. As time would progress, I was introduced to the work of Edward C. Curtis, who documented the Native American culture, these beautiful portraits of them. And um, I wouldn't learn about uh, Gordon Parks till later on. Ironically, my introduction to Gordon Parks came by way of his son, David. And I was in the army station in Germany back in the 1970s. I read his son's book called GI Diary. And that book grabbed me because it's basically a book about a, a young soldier who got drafted, went to Vietnam, but he's speaking about his father's relationship and that reminded me of my father's racist relationship. Here I am in the military, and I'm reading this book, the first book ever done by a black soldier in Vietnam, and that really did something to me, and it introduced me to the work of Gordon Parks. And then as time would progress, it would be James Van Der Zee when I came home from the military. And through the work of Van Der Zee, I was introduced to the Harlem Renaissance and the importance of documenting Afro-American people in a very dignified fashion. And then I have to speak about the impact that the work of Joseph Rodriguez had on me, you know, one I consider a mentor. And his work, Spanish Harlem, kind of like inspired me to want to document my community, but also get that work published. And then, and last but not least, uh, Anthony Barboza, you know, one of the members of Comungay, he served as a great inspiration to me, introducing, introducing me to work of studio work, but also the fine art of visual storytelling. Yeah. You know that this is interesting because everything you're saying, I went through the same thing. And I mean, you thank you for doing that for me. And then the you know uh, David's book, David Park's book, has been called by the guy who uh, I can't remember his name right now, but he he was the uh, this guy was the uh, inspiration for Apocalypse Now. And he said he read David's book and he said it was wow. the best book on it by a. a you know, a soldier out there doing his stuff and more and most honest, you know, that you, it's just unbelievable. But he's, he, he put it that way. I mean, the same people you're talking about, like, you know, who, who um, I got into Magnum is uh, they saw the work in Central America. And then I was in New York to meet with um, uh, somebody at ICP who was interested in 
work I'd done. And as I was leaving, I met I met to a friend of mine from Los Angeles, not from Los Angeles, from San Francisco. And we got to guy and him for a long time. He'd been to Vietnam. And he was there with Philip and with uh, 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 someone else who became the, the bureau chief at Magnum. Um, okay. And the thing is that I was still, you know, for the work in Central America, I was still wanting to know what I could have done better, what, what mm-hmm. maybe what I could have gone deeper. And people were saying, oh, great work, wonderful work. And that didn't mean a damn thing to me because it, I needed more, you know, more knowledge about what things I could have done. Anyway, um, I had a 52-page reprint that I gave to my friend and asked him if he could give it to Rosemary Wheeler. She was the bureau chief. He was staying at her place. And I said to I said to him, um, I said to I said to him, please ask her if she has any time, just to, if she gave him some feedback. I know she's very busy, you know, and all that kind of stuff. That was the best I could hope for, you know, I figured. Anyway, later that afternoon, after I got back to my mentor's place, uh, there's a phone call. Eli, came out for a second. You know, start again. Mm. Is it okay? Yeah, we lost you for a brief moment. Oh, okay. Okay, you're back. You're back. Okay. okay. Um. Anyway, when I answered the I answered the phone, Philip had, um, Philip Jones Griff was on the phone. And the first thing he said is, "I can't, I can't uh, reproduce his accent." Um, but he said, "He said, uh, uh, hello, this is Philip Jones Griffith. I'd like to seduce you into joining Magnum." And wow. I, I thought it was a joke because I ran into a lot of stuff where people were just, you know, you know, certain people were not very uh, honest or helpful. Let's put it that way, or whatever you want to call it. And so. Um, he, he said, you know, you'd like to work in Central America. And he asked if I could come to the office, the Magnum office. And I said, uh, well, I'm sort of busy today. <laughs> you might be, maybe you're free tomorrow? Because I wanted to, I wanted to see if there's some kind of, uh, if it was for real or not, you know. So it was for real. I went to see him. And he was very, I mean, the whole rep, the Magnum crew were very welcoming, you know. And I still kept on wondering, when's the, when's the joke going to hit, you know. But uh, I ended up uh, getting involved, and that's what uh, ended up going to you know, uh, to uh, Lebanon because somebody mm-hmm. was, somebody was leaving, and and because um, I know I covered a lot of stuff in Central America, and the guns were a little bit bigger, and they were a lot more accurate in in uh, in, in Lebanon. But mm-hmm. I figured I wanted to see for myself, and um, I know the Marines were getting hit hard. And, uh, and, uh, and there's also, I've been studying uh, the effect of nuclear war. And, and a lot of people don't know that we were close to World War III with Russia at that time, because mm-hmm. that's where the Lebanon thing was. So, um, I mean, it's, it's so many, and I think we've gone down the same path. And like, actually, uh, Jamel, this is the most I've heard you speak. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great. It's great. Well, I want to. I want to interject here because um, a lot of great points have been brought up and uh, you previously mentioned uh, Kamange. And so I know that both of you have been involved with this organization. So Eli, I just want to pose to you, when did you become a member of Kamange? Well, I was still in New York at the time. And so, you know, I've been in, uh, you know, uh, where we're at Austin for at least 16 years. And this was a number of years before I got first got involved. And Kamange, because I, was, I too, I, I was really inspired by a lot of things that were coming out of Kamange. Hey, 1963, and uh, making a statement with the work that was coming out. So that's what got me interested mm-hmm. in the Kamange. Mm-hmm. Great. Okay, so I have a series of um, images that I've curated with the both of you. And so I just want you to go through and uh, just kind of share the backstory behind them. So obviously, we have Tupac Shakur here, and you're famous image, um, Jamel Ruboy style. So if you wouldn't mind sharing the stories behind these images. Ruboy was a young man from my neighborhood of East Flatbush. He actually lived around the corner for me. His name was Carol, and I knew him when he was a young kid. And uh, when I came home from the military, him and I would connect. You know, he would be on the corner of my block almost every day. And we developed a really good friendship with each other. He might have been about three years younger than me. And he was just a very highly intelligent young man, you know, with a lot of hopes and dreams. And uh, I came home from the army during the summer of 1980, but unbeknownst to me, there was a war going on earlier that, before I came home. 
and he was probably, he was involved in it and other people I know were involved in it as well and they were enemies to each other. It's like the whole neighborhood just turned against each other during that short time I was away. And to my surprise, you know, he had major conflict that with people that used to come visit me. It was this ongoing war to the point where if I wasn't there, they would have took each other out. And I didn't find this out until later on that these, this conflict was going on. And, uh, and then when I would eventually find out, I was devastated because I was photographing all these young men in my community. I was engaging them. They all gave me respect. I became like a big brother to them, but they were at war with each other. And the, the common thing was they all, I had the respect of all of them. And Rude Boy was one that didn't mess around. You know, he was one known as a gunman. He was intelligent. But he was one that 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 was quick, you know. He had that 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 idea of kind of like a lot of guys back then. A lot of Western movies inspired people, so they took on that persona of gunman based off those those movies of, of the Wild West. And he was that type of person. But around me, I saw a whole different side. I saw a really kind-hearted, good person. But to other people, they didn't like him, and he was a part of that war. And I just found out recently that another friend of mine's who was once friends with him actually slashed him on his face. I'm just finding that out now. But sadly, uh, this young man, you know, he lost his life a few years after his photograph was taken. You know, he was Caribbean, he's from Grenada. He's a smooth guy, he, he had a lot of style to him. I took two frames of this image right here in, in Flatbush and we're going to be one of my most iconic photographs. But what has brought this full circle for me as well as so many of my other images, I reconnected with his son last year for the first time and through social media, Instagram, we were able to connect. And I was able to share stories with him about his father. At that time, he was still in his mother's womb and he <laughs> never met his father before. And I was able to give him a, a large 16 by 20 photograph of his beloved father who he was named after. Mm -hmm. You know, So uh, this young man represents sadly so many other young men who came up during a very troubling time where they were at odds with each other. And for me personally, I was try striving to use my position as a good person, as a big brother, as a photographer, to kind of guide these young men on a better path. And he was just one that I couldn't save. You know, so uh, this photograph means a whole lot to me right now. And I've actually frozen in time is to cover my, my forthcoming book, A Time Before Crack, because I want to remember him and so many others that came up during this time and no longer here. Mm, thank you. Eli? Well, um, I was working in the movie, um, Poetic Justice, and I had worked on the movie uh, Five Heartbeats, and I hadn't this. I had sort of decided not to work on the movies anymore because of that experience. But it was also a good experience, like uh, like you know, I'd, I'd still. To work, and I was curious because you know, the, the first movie he did was such a rocking strong, powerful uh, mm -hmm. thing to say that, that really got to a lot of people. And so I got there and also Janet Jackson. I was curious about Janet Jackson, who wouldn't be? Um, and uh, and then Tupac. And there's other rappers on the movie. And I didn't really know anything about rap music, to tell you the truth, you know? And, and so, but he was, he was unique. He was very uh, interesting to say the least. And one day he took off his shirt uh, for I think change of costume or something. And I saw the, uh, you know, the, the thing is wearing the pistol and I decided that I needed to do a portrait. And so I just told him, I said, hey, listen, I want to do a portrait for you, you know, and, you, you know, and I explained some of my reasons. I was trying to working it out in my own head. Why? Mm -hmm. And he, he agreed with me. And so we would meet at least uh, almost every time he was working. We talk a little bit about, about the way I wanted to approach it or ideas I had and so then finally, I mean, I, I was aware of like, it's in a similar thing we we're talking about with, you know, the portrait of here, he was in the, there's something's going, I could see it going down. I mean, his, in his face and his mm. expression. And uh, so it came time, came time for me to do the portrait and it was doing a shoot, you know, the, for the posters and stuff like that. And this was taken aside, you know, to, to do this portrait. So I explained to my the two assistants I had that, listen, you can say hello, good morning, whatever. He's a cool guy, you know, but don't get any long term kind of discussion because he's going through something and mm -hmm. and also he's working today also, you know, so, you know, just be cool. So mm -hmm. no sooner than I had said that, uh, another crew person came up and said, 
hey, do you hear what happened with Tuvok? I said, what? He said, just punched a hole in this wall, in the wall. Of his mm -hmm. And I said, wow. I, I turned to two people and said, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And mm -hmm. I also said, I did the, when it came time to do the thing, I said to, I told him Tuvok, because that's all I saw, whatever I saw, you know, it's those mm -hmm. three frames. And he, 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 you know, he thanked me and he, he walked off to get ready for another scene. And I said, as he's walking off, I said to my two assistants that he's going to be dead within two years or in, or in prison. And it wouldn't have been his fault because he wasn't, his, his guys, his hangout were doing the stuff that people were accusing Tupac up, really, mm -hmm. they were buddies. And within two years, he was gone. Like, uh, really, uh, something like. And I know when I'm when I'm shooting something like a portrait, somebody that uh, usually, if you have a chance to get to know them at all, you know, before, then uh, or movie sets, I would do pictures like again. If I said it was going to take twenty seconds or thirty seconds to do a shot, that meant it was going to they going to be fifteen seconds. If I said it was going to take a minute, that meant that was thirty seconds, you know, and so on. And uh, because you, you, it's connecting, uh, as you've done your photographs at the, you know, at the Carver Museum. I mean, it's really, uh, it's important to be able to see, to see beyond just the surface. Yeah. And so that's a picture that um, I came up with. It's hard, you know, he's an unforgettable person, obviously, you know, and, and that was my introduction to rap, you know, the hip hop thing in that way, by, by just being around him, observing his inter, you know, action with other people, and he was a good person. Yeah. Anyway. Thank you. Wow. To me, this is a uh, when I really started to understand the science of photography. My father pretty much took me under the wing, and he wanted me to understand what was most important: light and speed. You know, he he was against the idea of just creating snapshots. He wanted images that said something. So he. He, he drilled in me, you know, understanding shutter speed and, and knowing how to utilize light without a comp, without, without a, uh, a light meter. And he would just drill me on that. And when I look at this photograph, it, it really means a lot to me because I vividly remember when it came out, how I brought it home to my father to show him. And he was so pleased with not only this image, but there's two other frames. And he realized at that point that I'm beginning to really understand the science of photography because he felt it was as easy to pick up a camera, point and shoot and get an image. But he felt that I needed to create images that said something. And this particular day I was walking, another lesson my father gave me, walk with your camera out, no cap on, have it set always, you know, for the most part, at, at, for those photographers that, that are listening, 1 25th of a second at f, f, f 5.6 with 400 film, give or take. And for the most part, if you see a situation, you can just rise and capture that moment without having to fumble through your bag and fumble through your settings. So this photograph was taken a few blocks from my home and it's just kids doing their thing. You know, these are kids that caught, if they had the proper training, caught, probably could even have gone on to the Olympics. And, you know, we look at it now like, man, how could these kids get on a dirty mattress like that and do that? But that's something that even reminded me of my youth and it's a tradition that we as naive kids did throughout our lives. And uh, it was going to be one of my most iconic photographs to my surprise, you know. Uh, it, it, it lays the cover of my book, Seconds of My Life. It would go on to serve as the on the Undone album cover for the Roots, and uh, it, it currently sits, you know, at the Whitney Museum. Hmm. Eli, well, this is uh, um, my friend Bud Williams, who's passed on. He grew up in Harlem, um, and I introduced him to the director of their Daily News paper because he, uh, well, he met at his rodeo, a black rodeo in Harlem. And he became one of our best friends. And uh, every Monday, if I was in town, and he also his day, his, his, he was off on Mondays, we just he'd ride around Harlem and he'd tell me about the various places and things like that. And we used to actually have breakfast at a table in this restaurant. Uh, I think it was on 31st Street, maybe. Uh, anyway, where, where Malcolm X used to have breakfast there, and there's a there's a little thing of on the on the wall where the table that he ate at. And, Saying, ever if you're out shooting, you know you're out shooting, 
And uh, I saw this scene of these kids in the car. And the thing that picture that makes it for me, the thing that picture that makes it for me is the girl at the top, the little girl at the top, because she's looking at, looking out straight ahead, almost defiant, like I will be who I'm going to be. You know, it wasn't mm-hmm. any if fans and buts about it. And I love the picture, they love the section of the picture when the kids is he's uh, supporting a little baby in a car. But that's you know, it's like uh it's an image of America. I mean, that shouldn't be the way that is, you know. And uh so I'm I won't say it was political, it was like life. And mm. you, and you have to be looking into what life is about, not not just uh, oh it's you know it's the same thing like with the picture that you did. Um, it's it's like there's a lot of things going on in that picture that makes you think and, and look further. So they, they have a lot in common with each other. One's black and white, one's yes. color. So, okay. you know, that's the way that goes. Yeah. I also found this picture that uh, kind of resembled each other for the two of you. Mm, I realize wow. I have too many photos, but it's okay. We'll get through them. you like, can you talk about this image here? This is uh, uh, covering the... the uh, what happened in uh, Minnesota and to his, his, I almost hate to even say his name, George Floyd funeral, right? And, and um, I, I mean, I had to cover this because it was such a uh, important thing to be there. I covered a lot of stuff. There was things I covered I was very angry about and, and you had to maintain, you know, had to maintain your sense of being to be able to make photographs. And this is with a lens that's longer lens. I like working with short lenses, working close up, you know? But, you know, trying to cover to get a defining image without thinking I needed a defining image. I wanted to cover it. You know? And to me, it said a lot with the, the men in behind, men behind and a force coming through there. It's like, this ain't going away. This is not. I had uh, some issues. I. I sort of like fainted, <laughs> basically. Hot sun and, and under didn't estimate uh, under expectation of what was going on. Anyway, um, and then I, remember I sort of came conscious when four people, were, uh, four men were picked me up and got me to the shade. You know, and one mm-hmm. of was my former students, Tamir. You know, and uh, but you know, it's like um, you can't. You, I don't. I don't like to think about stuff too much. I think about it before I get near there. I I get near where I'm going to be photographing and just let my, you know, my instincts hit on the pictures. That's why you don't talk about it. It's the same thing, not talking, oh, talking about a um, a novel that doesn't get made, you know, in a way. So you have to make a commitment to, to capture what was going on there, you know, and, and, um, and that's what I think I did. And I underestimated myself because you don't think about it later but it was important to get these images that maybe I wouldn't have made normally, you know, you had to keep, keep going. And, and, uh, and yeah, this is one of those pictures where I was sort of surprised when I, when I looked at it later, you know, but it said something without having to have a good conversation within myself, just do mm-hmm. it. You know? mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. Shimon? And, and this particular photograph goes back to my father's teaching. And again, carry your camera everywhere you go, have it out, set, ready. And here I'm on Delancey Street. It's a, it's a rainy day. Besides uh, Brooklyn, this is an area I've been photographing for well over 40 years. I like, I like just the old field of the street. So I'm, I'm walking and I see this uh, gentleman with his dog and I'm anticipating that something's going to happen. It's just a feeling, a gut feeling I got. It's, it's intuition. So I, I, I positioned my, myself in the center of the street and sure enough, you know, he, he, he had his dog and he, and he started swinging it. And I had my camera out and I was able to get off three frames. You know, I have another image. I took a, a, a second after this one, which is almost identical. And it was going to be one of my most iconic photographs called Man and Dog. What's so profound about this image, you know, it's, it's one that always stayed with me for a long time is that I would go on to have a dog just like that and have a similar relationship with my dog just like this here some uh, 40 years later. You know, so this image, uh, it, it embraces the cover of my book, Sights in the City. It's a very important image to me. Again, the relationship between man and dog. What's important as well, this, you know, equal to the, the kids flipping the mattress is understanding light and speed. 
and, and being willing to take a chance, having that camera out, having your camera properly set, not being afraid of the rain, anticipating a moment and freezing a moment in time. You know, so I'm very grateful that I was at, at, the, at the right place at the right time to capture, you know, one of my, I'll say this is probably my number one photograph right here. Out of all of my images, this is probably the top photograph of all. Okay. Uh, I, I focus on themes a lot. You know, one of the things that my father stressed to me early on is always have themes. So when you step outside, you have in your mind an idea on what it is you want to anticipate. So I always had a number of themes working in my head at any given moment. So this is a particular thing. It's two things going on in here, it's really three themes. I have twins, which is a body of work I've been developing for a number of years, and then mothers and, and sons. And then the third theme is Harlem. I spent uh, many years documenting the Harlem community, wanting to uh, continue what James Van Der Zee started. And so Harlem became very close to my home. So uh, here you have a, a young woman with her two sons. And you know, uh, I approached, and it's really interesting because I had saw this woman some many years later, earlier, and it's the photograph I didn't get. It was her with her brother on a train. And I just felt that the body language is off. She would probably tell me no, and I never took that photograph. And she was dressed pretty much the same way with her brother. And, and they were sitting in front of me. It was the perfect shot. But I knew that if I would have asked them, they would have told me no. So here I would see this sister many years later. And I was able to approach her and capture this photograph right here, which is very close to my heart, called Mother and Sons. Mm -hmm. Eli, mo mother's love. what's going on with us um, in this picture with Tunica, Mississippi? I'm sorry. Yes, Tunica. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tunica is a, there's, I was working on an assignment, a basketball uh, shoot for Sports Illustrated um, uh, for a special issue they were doing. And I knew about Tunica because Jesse Jackson had talked about it and um, was going on in Tunica. And so I made two trips. The first trip was exploratory. I mean, after I finished the assignment, I, I uh, had my assistant drive me there. And uh, it was, I mean, rough. This is America, right? Mm -hmm. So going to Black America. And this is like the second trip. I went back. Actually, some things had changed. Like before, there, was, uh, there wasn't even, you know, toilets and some of the houses, mm -hmm. you know. And that was, uh, that was acceptable to the white residents of uh, Tunica. And I, thought, I thought that, oh, the Black people didn't care. Um, that was fine for them. But that was not because Jesse Jackson had, had raised a, you know, raised the hell about that, you know, and, and things things happened that helped. Now this is this is, you know mother and her, her child and um it was just one of the pictures on the second trip there. Um mm. it, it was uh, it, you know it's like uh it's disheartening so in so many ways and I basically try to clear my mind of everything when I when I go think because I think about it before I get there and then when I get there I just try to clear you know everything away. Um let it come to wherever it's coming to. So the moments are, are there and just have to be ready for it. Like, you know, your father was teaching you, uh, you know, be ready. And it's a, it's a, it's a normal thing. That's, you, you always should be ready if you're on the street with your camera, you know, or any place. Right. I take pictures all the time when I'm even in my own apartment, when there's nothing going on, there's always something going on. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm going to have to skip through some images because we want to make sure we get to the Q&A and uh, there's several images in a short film that I want to show towards the end. So just L love is a very important element in, in my creative process. I find that when you find people that love each other, they're easy to approach and document. So uh, a, a lot of my work, which is another theme, the theme is love and it's couples. So here you have a young man downtown Brooklyn and he's with his girl and um. Uh, you know, I, I photographed him over the years. You know, he's probably, he was one of my early subjects when I came home from the military. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw him with his girl and I was able to just capture this very, very intimate moment. So again, lo love is, is, is an essential element. People often ask me, what do you look for in a photograph? It's, it's love and it's joy. Those are like two very important elements that, this, this, that makes really the foundation of my work. Mm -hmm. Uh, you like, want to talk about this photo? Yeah, this is a picture. I was doing a story for I think it was a, I think it was a New York Times magazine about uh, orphans. 
and this place, there was a school for orphans in, in Michigan. And uh, this is one, of, he'd been, he was orphan and um, he had, uh, I feel like of him and a couple other uh, people that they grew up together in, in the orphanage. And uh, mm. it just was a, you know, moment of joy. I was happy for them, you know, but it was just, uh, I was in, I think I was inside the car that I was driving and uh, I made that photograph. It's it just a wonderful moment. You know, it's, hey, love is always a good thing, you know? Yeah. So, so uh, I, I just like that. I like that one a lot. Yeah, I remember seeing this image in the book and just kind of leaping for joy. I just thought it was so beautiful. So I had to include it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, for me, I'm always looking to create an image that says something. So this particular young man, he worked in a hat store, which is perfect. You know, he got his hat on and to photograph him just on the street is one thing, but to, to back them up and put them with the hats, it just takes it to another level. So my creative process, I'm always trying to make images that really speak to the time. And this is just, just perfect timing, you know, having an opportunity to see him, to approach him. I, I like Eli's approach. I was watching his videos earlier. It, I like to engage people, have conversations first. You know, the image comes later on, but I, I, I have a tendency, I, I, I see people, I introduce myself, I show them my business card. In many cases, I have my portfolio to let them know that my intentions are sincere. And I learned from Eli too, he was having a conversation with someone uh, in one of his films and he, you know, he gave his business card and said, I'll give you a copy of the photograph. So I like doing it because that helps to build bridges. So this particular young man, the photograph was taken in lower Manhattan. He worked in the store. I saw him, I would see him occasionally and uh, he just gave it to me. And I remember going back and giving him a copy of the photograph and it made him good. It made him feel really good that not only did I capture this moment, but I was able to pass on a copy to him at the same time. Okay, this this picture here, the Mega Man March. I was planning to go, uh, no matter what, I wasn't worried about an assignment. Then um, Life Magazine called, and I ended up, you know, on assignment for them. But this was I stayed at a at a hotel the night before that was close to where it was going to begin, and I got there early on. It was still dark, you know, and and so I was at at, at the very front. And I hadn't figured out what exactly I was going to do, but they started at the front, see what happens. And um, and these were these gentlemen were there, and it's, it's funny. It's one of the most popular pictures I've ever made, rightly, uh, mm. you know. And and uh, there's another picture I, that I, there were three men with different hats and different age ages were up in the uh, up in the stands. I had to sneak past about five different police agencies to get up there. Mm -hmm. uh, what I did was the first one I, I went to uh, this guy and said, well, you are not you don't have passes for you to go there because I was a photographer. If you're a normal person, you could go, you know, just go up there. So I said, well, um, I, I, I lied. I said somebody somebody had given me permission to come up there. So let me check. As soon as he, he, he said that, he walked off. And <laughs> uh, up or place and I saw it behind but um, you know the picture I got finally the one uh, uh, behind the thing that showed all those men I showed to somebody who's a specialist in mapping things like that he said yeah there's a million guys there <laughs> you know <laughs> you know <laughs> I saw two uh, um, photographers from AP and from UPI and they came up for one minute and then boom split I think they took a picture, but I, I just waited hours and hours. I knew something was, I felt something was going to happen that was worthwhile. And it was just three men, they were back facing the, uh, you know, it's from the back and it worked out really well. So yeah, and this is an incredible photograph. I saw it in your book yesterday. And that's, that's just one amazing photograph. So I'm glad that you got a chance to talk about it because that really caught my eye. The, the composition, everything about that photograph really speaks to that day. Yeah. There's, there's also another photo that you have, Eli, from the Million Man March, where there are three guys and they're embracing, they're hugging. as a really special moment as well, too. Right. Yeah, right. that was uh, that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. This photograph, uh, the girl on bike. I actually, the actual title was "A Time of Innocence," and that's one of the, that's when I started to really shoot a lot of black and white. My father introduced me to Trix Film, Trix Four Hundred, and and I was working on a new theme, you know, and that theme was called The Other Side. And I decided that rather than photograph people from the front, I was going to redirect my lens towards people from the back 
and there's a beauty within the back just as much as the front. So this is a, this is really the, the first start of, of working on that particular series. Um, the, the other side, and it's called The Time Before Crack. But I like to call it The Time Before Innocence because I pretty much just came home from the military and despite the conflict that is going on around me, I saw so much joy and hope amongst the children. And a, a lot of my earlier work was really focused on just children. You know, unlike today, I'm very apprehensive to approach them. Back during the early days, I just saw innocence with children and I wanted to document this. And this is in my neighborhood of, of Flatbush. It's on Church and Flatbush Avenue. And it's just a, a decisive moment where you have two young children enjoying a summer day you know, in, 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 a, in an environment where there was no need to be fearful, unlike the world that we live in today, yeah. where so many people are being shot, you know, innocent kids are getting caught in a crossfire. This was, in fact, the time of innocence. So it's one of my most important photographs that just represents a very different day and time for me. Mm -hmm. okay. Janelle, Eli's gone to the restroom really quickly. Okay, no worries, no worries at all. Okay, and this is the Flappers area where I, I trained a lot of my, I spent a lot of time in this particular neighborhood. You know, I lived there. And when I first came home from the service, I was really striving to reacquaint myself with the neighborhood. So I found certain locations that were populated with a lot of people. And I would just go out and spend hours, you know, on this major avenue, just looking for people to photograph. On this particular day, I saw this young lady about to make a phone call. And, you know, I could tell she was a model. And to my surprise, she just gave it to me. You know, I aimed my camera and it was, I don't even remember having a conversation. And being, being, I guess she was a model, she was used to being in front of the camera. She just pretty much gave it to me. And uh, it was going to be a very important photograph. And what's interesting about this image, I just rediscovered it after like 40 years going through my old negatives, you know, you know which I enjoy doing because it gives me an opportunity to kind of like go back into time. And back in the old days, the old places that we would get the, the film printed at, sometimes they would, they would print your work but skip over images. So when I was going through my negatives, I came upon this photograph that I had no memory of, and I ended up getting developed, and it went on to be a really powerful photograph in light of the fact that we don't really see, see phone booths anymore. You know, so it, it's a classic image that means a lot for me. Flatbush is probably one of the most documented communities out of all of my work, being I lived there. It was, it was a very diverse community that was a combination of African-American and Caribbeans. And uh, it was a place that was full of energy. So one of my next projects down the road is to do an entire book on just the Flatbush community. Okay, I'm gonna advance because um, to this photo and then I wanna show a, a film from Eli. Um, Eli, can you talk about this film on the, on the left here? Yeah, um, well, this is, this is um, I was asked to do a photograph for the studio and I did, you know, I did a, a bunch of pictures and various angles and zoom lens going back and forth and it was fine, it was good. And I had my uh, a Rolleiflex camera that I wanted to do a picture of, of these three guys <laughs> for myself. And mm. you know, uh, you know, Ice Cube, he was getting ready to produce Lawrence Fishburne. He didn't want to be called Larry Fishburne anymore, mm -hmm. you know. And then they were saying for John that he needed another hit or something. And it was irritating, but they were all in different places, moving in a certain kind of direction. And so the pictures I did of that were fine for what the studio wanted, but this one I just I did for myself. Um, I said felt three uh, three gentlemen who were moving forward, you know, in different ways, and um, it was very quick. Again, it was one of those a few frames, I guess. I, I don't remember if they had it on a context sheet uh, or if it was a full thing, but it it worked out. I, I wanted to get uh, like I gave uh, I, I made had. Prince made. I gave one to John, and he, re, he, he that's why he he, uh, he got excited and went back to school to study still photography because he realized the importance of having control over you know when when uh, complete control like when you're directing the film that's important that you your vision really goes into it. And um, Ice Cube, as soon as he saw the print, says, "Where's my?" <laughs> so I slapped the <laughs> nose. <man. laughs> and. You know, and Mr. Frischburn, I have one waiting for him. This was a long time ago, <laughs> but uh, so when the higher learning, so when uh, we get near him sometime, I'll say, hey, I got this print you might want to see. So uh, hmm. that was a, I mean, the, the most interesting photographs sometimes are the ones where you're least, uh, 
you're not really prepared for. You don't want to be prepared. You just want to be uh, sweeping, moving, you know, the, that kind of stuff. And I'm, for me, it's always, you know, happening sort of quickly, you know, mm. and I could tell you a million stories, mm -hmm. <laughs> including the one where uh, Janet Jackson asked, asked, uh, asked me to marry her, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, that's not a nice. story line. You can't have, right? you gonna do us like that. Janet Jackson asked you to marry you, just want to say another story? Well, okay, <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, that's a good time for a month. Okay, why are you guys not married? That's well, I'll, I'll tell you, you saw the picture before, right? The picture yes. Before. Well, uh -huh. we're on location going on there, and she came out of her trailer, arrived with a car, and I said, Janet, you're looking hot today, you know? And so oh, she, 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 yeah, <laughs> she, looked at, she looked at me and smiled and took my hand and said, Eli, will you marry me? And I said, wow. well, Janet, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to accept your offer, even though I know you're going to renege because your boyfriend's standing right over there. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm going to tell everybody what you said. So I'm just getting into the law. <laughs> so, oh, that's a great story, Eli. <laughs> that, that, uh, she, that's a good one. She, she actually wanted me to shoot um, uh, a music video she was doing, but I was in uh, Northern England working for Save the Children, and she called Magnum, and, and they, they told her, it says, I don't think he's going to come back because <laughs> he's going to fly me to Los Angeles to do the shoot, which I would have liked, you know, because I like her. She's really nice. She went through a lot of stuff and some things that she did, I was impressed with. And so would even the Teamsters were impressed on the movie Higher Learning, you know, mm -hmm. when you had to develop uh, uh, something uh, to uh, crying because of the opening part when you had the drive-in movie and her boyfriend gets shot, you yeah. know, she, and she, she did produce tears without any help. Yeah. She did it four mm -hmm. or five times, you know, the, the, during the shoot. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of hers. Okay, I just want to, I'm going to have to advance through all of this, but I just want to give the viewers a moment to look at some images. I want to. And this was in Beirut. And, uh, yeah. You had to run for a life and I had to tell. Mm. And then when you do respond. And so that was our only out. I had to run about, I uh, got a hundred yards to. This place, we're getting shelled. It was like stuff was coming in like, mm. like, like rain. That is not a good feeling. That is not a good feeling. Wow. Mm -hmm. How have you dealt with, um, you know, you, you photographed in a lot of challenging environments. How have you dealt with like not having the weight of those surroundings like really seep into your soul? Not very good sometimes. And sometimes it gets you free from other things. This guy, well, you see what there. It's, it's like um, I had to go to the therapist at one point, you know, because of. Uh, now, post traumatic stress is very real, and sometimes uh, you know, I have things here, but I respond. I mean, I come out of it, but you have to, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think about the people who, like the military, the army is various places, and you know, I'm, you know, Ukraine. There's they're fight, they're fighting for their lives, and uh, you know, and they're no, like the United States. When I went to Beirut, it was the proper thing to do. It was it meant there was more things going on than most people imagine. You know, and they did the right thing. I met a lot of really great people, souls that this is their job. So mm -hmm. they do what you have to do. And so it's it's like it's not about you. That's the thing that when you work on stuff, it's about the people that are engaged in whatever way they're engaged in. And uh, you do your best. Um, the worst thing you can do is to get somebody make somebody cry more because of what you're doing. So it's it's um, I think I worked in the hospital for 11 years. At, mm -hmm. you know, I was going to school and then. I realized I wanted to be a photojournalist. Um, so that's six more years at the, the cancer ward. And, you know, this, you, you learn a lot and uh, you may cry later, but you don't have time to cry if you're working. You know, that, that's mm -hmm. the thing. So anyway, such as, uh, such as life and death and whatever else comes along with it. Yep. So you learn from people. You yeah. learn. So pardon me, I have to advance through these images. It's so hard choosing images to talk to the both of you. My goodness. But I did want to show um, this short film um, from Eli from A Long Walk Home. So we'll just take a moment to do that. And then also I want to share um, a few more images before we go into Q&A. Sure.
Whenever I'm alone with you You make me feel like I am home again Whenever I'm alone with you You make me feel like I am Beautiful work, Eli. I, I, I love it. Powerful. Thank you. Thank you. And that's the last one. Um, I'm inspired. 
when the world is inspiring, we just follow up on it, right? You know, yeah. and the work yeah. that you do is like, you know, everybody should go to the Carver Museum, take a look, take a good look. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you for going to see the show. And so Eli, there are several color images that you wanted to show and share you with can, us. I just want to go. Just let it run, just let it run. Like uh, I can talk about, okay. so I don't, I don't want to take up all the time. You know? These first two were in Tekken and Harlem. Mm. That was in the, the one in Harlem with the three guys, what year was that, Eli? I don't remember. It was like the, the director of, um, oh, what's it called, the movie? With, uh, it anyway the director asked me to go and no not that either the director asked me to to get do some pictures that sort of captured the the uh, era of the 60s for the movie mm. like sure. uh, denzel washington was a star you know with russell crowe you, you remember anyway oh right okay yes yeah. so i i american, walked american gangster yeah american gangster i walked around uh, i was supposed to work on it but it, it changed my schedule was i couldn't I couldn't do that. So this is like the first five days. I spent about an hour each day, uh, hour and a half maybe, to find pictures that that uh, got that feeling from the '60s. And you know, these hairdressers wearing they used to, you know, had to from stockings, you know. Mm -hmm. Now you can go to a pharmacy and and get those those things. That was the very first picture I made. It was like funny because I thought, wow, you know, the first picture, and uh, and I just proceeded. I walked along and. That was my favorite favorite shoots, you know. Because mm, I, I love the color. Yeah, well, that's the uh, next book I do is going to be in color, full color, whatever. But you know, it's like, what the, what can I tell you? It's it, it was it, it was wonderful. I just I, that was one of my favorite shoots in Harlem. Mm. Mm, okay. Yeah, and this was in Harlem. This was in Beirut. Mm -hmm. uh, um, El Salvador. I, I was introduced to the book El Salvador by uh, the, the movie by James Wood, who played the photographer. Oh, that, that was great. That, that, that was yeah, great. That, that was, really introduced me to the, to the tragedy of war in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, that what I liked about it was getting to the human touch, not just getting getting killed, but the mental thing that does to people that live in yes. that. You know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and James Wood was always good. That's one of the best. Uh, you know. So you really got that flavor uh, of who the character was, you know? And yes, yes. It was That's based on... Really yes. And it, it just it just was a place to capture a certain kind of thing, and he did it really well. Uh, you know, the, the movie uh, that was taken from a, a, a obituary in the New York Times... And it touched on, uh, he, he touched it. The guy who did, uh, uh, well, I won't even go into that. It doesn't matter. This was good. This was the, the next year, uh, 9 12, 9 11. There. This is when they were doing, they had a moment of silence. And these people didn't know each other. They mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. did together, you know. And I was in China. I made a lot of trips to China before the pandemic hit. The last mm -hmm. time. Was okay. That was on a place near the Great Wall. Great Wall isn't like what you see all the time, you know, in, in uh, pictures of the Great Wall. This is, it's like, you know, going there was like crumpled up, you know, on top of it, just grass. It's not that road there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of interesting things uh, that were really interesting in there. Wow. I got to ask you too, Eli, you, how did you make it, how, how was it that you didn't go to Vietnam? Because you seem like you were of age during that time. Did you? I wanted to go. I wanted to go. And my, hmm. my eyes, I was blind as a bat. I mean, like, I had this operation later in life, but I had very thick glasses and I had, there's my feet were sort of screwed up. And I, I really tried. And I, I met um, a guy who's uh, one of the people that, you know, try to get you to come and join. 
And, but then with time, and finally I, I tried again and, and it was like, is it going to pull people? Oh, I can't guarantee that you go to Vietnam. And mm. so, uh, but there's stuff going on, but uh, actually the first thing I covered uh, at Fort Dix was a demonstration. And that was like <laughs> tear gas and everything else. And there's one picture I made, everybody had a mask except for myself and this one, uh, Uh, the book uh, you know that he did in Vietnam um, was was one of the things that was inspiring, but also Donna McCollum's work. You know, they were making mm. pictures that were more than just capturing the moment. This is in um, Moz Mozambique, uh, and mm. uh, she was a grandmother, and these are twins, and her both parents were dead, passed away. Let's work with the UN. Well, let's go into our Q and A. Let's see. Um, so Roberto wants to ask, what goes into deciding to shoot something in color versus black and white? How do you guys make that decision? Hmm, interesting. Um, I, I just go by like by instincts, really. If I'm on assignment, they maybe want me to shoot it in color or in black and white. And uh, when I went to Beirut, it was uh, practically all color, but I did shoot a lot of black and white. That's obvious when you see the other pictures. Um, but that's because you shoot for magazines also. And so it was like basically the first time I did serious editorial photography in color. And but the, the black and white pictures were like special, but I was able to get images that told the story and the historical importance, you know, that kind of thing. And but black in America, obviously, it was just I, I wanted I didn't want any interruptions. I wanted to be able to go with the flow and with respect to, you know, the subject of people who have done good work before. But it wasn't so much that it was like just an instinctual thing, you know, and I'm shooting mostly color now. But not, but then there's also. There's things I see in black and white and I get excited, you know, and I want to do it. So just jump into it, you know. I, I don't really usually set a particular way to do it. Yeah. And, and, and same here, you know, for the most part, I, I, I for many years I carried two cameras with me. One that had black and white film and one had colored film. And I went on a lot of times with just instinct, you know, what I was just feeling at that time. It's really right. hard to say. And, uh, and and being I used a lot of 400 film for 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 uh, black and white, I was dealing with a lot of available light. So a lot of my subway pictures were I would redirect it and do a lot of subway work in black and white because of available light and not want to use a flash. And during that same time period, I was doing a lot of my own development. I had my dark room, so mm -hmm. I didn't know how to develop color. I focused more on black and white. So that kind of like uh, informed my decision to shoot a lot of black and white early on during that time period. Um, today, I, I, I'm, it's still my process. And, you know, luckily with the digital photography, I could switch, mm -hmm. but it's just a feeling a lot of times. There's moments in which I convert color images into black and white because there's a certain type of feeling I'm trying to get, but it, it's really, it, it's a difficult decision. There's certain images I shot in black and white. I wish I could have shot in color, you know, so that's why I decided to just keep both cameras with me. And a lot of my newer work, there's images both black and white in color, the same exact image that I might shoot it in black and white first and I'll shoot it in color just to have that, just to have that choice in certain situations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, another question we have is, how has digital cameras changed your approach, if at all? Well, for me, for it's me, only, okay, go for it, go for it. <laughs> okay, the, the joy of digital photography for me, it, it's two things. For me, to be able to capture the image of a person and then show them that image in real time and see that expression of joy in their face. I love that moment. Because before, when just shooting film back in the days, you approach the person, you convince them that your intentions are sincere, they put their trust in you, perhaps they may get a copy of that picture a week down the road. But now with digital photography, I could take your photograph, I could show it to you in real time, I could upload it to my computer and send you a JPEG, and I, I absolutely love that right now. I love the fact I don't have to get work processed no more. I could just shoot, come home, and just upload images. So it's made it easier for me, uh, especially when it comes down to just connecting with people. Because in this day and time, to shoot film and, and to document street people, they want to see that picture in real time. They're not trying to wait a week or two weeks. 
you take a photograph, they want to see that right away. So I find that in this modern day society, dealing with digital photography, it makes it easier to interact with people. And at the same time, when you show them that picture, how fly it looks, they get excited and they want to take more photographs because they, they are now seeing it in real time. So I think that digital photography has enhanced my process and has made it more fun and has strengthened my connections with the people which I photograph. Mm -hmm. Uh, one, uh, it's like interesting because it's there's so many things that I like. My, that, I don't worry so much about young people, but occasionally, yeah, that's a good idea. You can show somebody to see that you're serious. And I think about one of them, uh, New Mexico. When I, I went to New Mexico, well, I was working on a movie there, and then I was shooting things for this book project. And uh, well, in this, this particular time, the there's a woman I photographed her and her daughter. I really liked the picture a lot, and but she didn't want to sign the, the release. And then she looked me up in the thing, and she said, oh, it was okay, because I shouldn't color then. But I like the control you have on color also. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like, uh, and I get into more interesting things. I come from an art, art experience also with color. So it's like a natural place to flow into, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, But before, I said, so, so, you know, most of the stuff was black and white. Now most of the stuff was color. I mean, I can't remember the last time I actually shot something black and white, to tell you the truth. Mm. Uh, so it was not far away, but you know, it's it's a big, big improvement. Okay. Yeah. All right. One other question. Maybe I'll start with Eli. Um, has there ever been a time where you missed a chance to photograph a specific moment? Can you tell that story. Uh, you know, I was told that that when I went to Beirut, that that I said you're going to see a lot of pictures not going to be able to take, but that didn't happen. I mean, it's one occasion, and that was when I remember you making the pictures, but this. Um, this uh, hospital that got hit by the, the, the battleship of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, the, pre the head of the hospital camp was screaming at me when he found I was American. And I said, I, I, asked, I told him, and he spoke English, I understand. But, uh, uh, yeah, so the, this was coming 26 miles away. The shell is because there's a group from their group was uh, was hitting the the, the the Marines every night with some severe stuff. I mean, really bad stuff. And, you know, it's a two way street. And he, he calmed down when I, when I talked to him that way. But 90% of the time, I never had problems photographing what I wanted to photograph in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't have that, that problem. Okay. Jamal, have you ever missed a photograph? A chance to um, take there, a there was one picture that I missed, and I speak about it in a book called The Photographs Not Taken. And I remember being down in New Orleans, and I was walking one day by the water, and I saw this this, this young man, uh, young white male, and he had the Nazi uh, SWAT sticker tattooed in his forehead. And, and I thought that was so deep that this guy had these feelings that were so profound. He felt the need not to put the tattoo in his arm or his chest but it was this large tattoo in the center of his head and he was a skinhead. And I regret not getting that photograph. You know, his body language is actually positive. And I knew that if I would approach him, I would have gotten it. But whatever reason I hesitated and I didn't get that shot. Because not only would I, if I would approach him, we would have had a conversation, but I would have got the image at the same time. But I was so taken aback by seeing it I just felt that he wouldn't let me get it. But as I re-examined that day, shortly afterwards when I left him, you know, despite him having that tattoo on his forehead, there was something warm about him and approachable. I think mm -hmm. he might've even been homeless. So I would have gotten that photograph and it, it would have said a whole lot, you know, but that was back in the 1990s. So that's one photograph that I missed. And in missing an image, what I do now, you know, I get work drawn. There's a few images in my life that I've never captured, but through artists, they can conceptualize what it is I saw and bring that image back to life. Or if there's an image I miss, I'll recreate it. That one I can't, I can't actually re recreate if I really wanted to, just to tell the story. But that's the main image that I think about every now and then that I, that I didn't get. And, I, and I, I promised myself, I will never hesitate again. The most a person can tell me is no, but at least let me take making an attempt to get that image. And I didn't want to be disrespectful and just take it. Because a lot of times that produces conflict. This is a situation where it was just better to ask and ask sincere in, in a sincere manner. And I, I really believe full force that I would, I would have been able to get that image. So that's probably like the only time that I let a, a really profound image get away from me. Okay. There, there was another time, like when I was working for the Detroit News where myself and a reporter, we were sent to photograph this park where they said there was a drugs going around. There's 
some other stuff was like people having sex or something and you know it's shocking so the news sends, sent me in this reporter and so the one thing they didn't talk about was the violence level level mm-hmm. like we get there in the back of a sheriff's car um to you know those rounds and and somebody comes around to his car and says there's a gang fight you know when there's all kinds of I mean, he was bleeding you know and so the the, um, the sheriff's deputy jumped out of the car to run toward it and, and we we're screaming and banging on the we're locked in the back seat and then we he he lets us um, he comes back opens the door so we can get out and they run to the thing and there was a a guy uh, there's a two different gangs are fighting and there's one guy on, on the ground who has been stabbed in the leg or something like that and his guys were gathered around it was like a scene out of a look like out of Vietnam or something like coming in helicopters you know the, the guy was on the ground and as soon as I took I took one picture. And, and they, they turned on yelling at me, you know, really pissed off. And, and then I, I said to, I said to him, I says, Hey, you're taking care of your friend. And then they said, Oh, okay. <laughs> and they let me photograph. They didn't stop me because uh, just because I said, you're taking care of your friend, which is what they were doing. Mm-hmm. They wrote that picture on the front page of the paper uh, the next day, big, big. Yeah. Cause it was, I forget the name of the park, uh, Heinz park, Heinz, Heinz park. That's what it was. But that was one of a few times I remember being, yeah, you know, no, I'm going to dare take a picture. But that first frame I made was the one. That's what you do normally. Like when you want to get through to somebody, you want to make that picture. Mm-hmm. And you get, and you got to be respectful and you're going to, you know, honestly. And then, uh, right. you know, th- that helps a lot. You know, so to say what's wrong, what's going on. Awesome. Okay, this last question I think is a great uh, ending point. So this is from Chuka. He says, can Eli and Jamel speak on the moral and spiritual aspects of their craft as photographers and if they feel a sense of moral responsibility in their work? Um, That's a really great question. Mm-hmm. And um, for me, I look at having the ability to see as a divine gift. I'm so blessed that I can see, you know, I know a lot of people that are blind, you know, born blind. So the fact that I have this divine gift, I feel it comes with responsibility that I have to use this to bring some good in the world, you know, and and, and I strive to do that every day of my life. You know, I I have the ability, I look at the larger body of my work as being visual medicine. And we think about the vaccinations. I feel that I'm trying to visually vaccinate people with images that represent joy, hope, and possibility, you know, so it is an assignment for me. I feel that, you know, the camera is a compass that has put me on this, this very long path for 40 years. And I, everything I'm seeing, I'm meant to see for whatever reason, you know, having the ability to freeze time in motion is alchemy. And it's a, it's a gift. And I just feel that at this point in my life that everything I do has to be grounded in, in, in the spiritual base. Even when I sell work, Profit I get has to go into different organizations to help help people who are in great need right now. So when I sell images, I always look to or how can I take this money and donate it for, to causes that are going to help humanity and make the world a better place. With photography being this global language and having technology now to share images around the world in real time through social media, I hit, feel I have a responsibility every day to put images on my social media feed that's going to inspire people in some form or fashion. So to me, it's, it's, it's missionary work in a very unique way. It has allowed me to connect with people, to, to, to have conversations around the globe like never before in my life, again, due to technology. What's happening now, a lot of young people are reaching out to me, telling me that I photographed their parents who are no longer here. So now I'm sending them photographs of their parents that they've never seen before, and mm-hmm. it's helping them with the healing process beyond anything I could ever imagine. I'm posting photographs on my Instagram feed and so many people reached out to me telling me that that's my mother, that's my father, that's my brother. My wife died last week and you have you posted a picture of her. Ironically, it came up. I get that almost every day. So I realized that what I'm doing is a very important work that's been given to me. It's assignment I embrace. I no longer look at it as photography. I do look at myself as an alchemist. And, and again, my camera is, is something that has put me on this path for a reason. And I have to, and I'm just glad that I've come upon that realization that this is my purpose in life. I have to not only record these moments and, 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 and guide people along the path where I felt that I've met, 
but the images in which I kept now become a historic record in contributing to the preservation of history and culture at the same time too. So it's bigger than me. It's about being a contributor and being a heel at the same time. Mm -hmm. The way I've gone about it is like uh, pretty much sort of what you're saying, but the only difference is that uh, I think it was something that you're supposed to do, you know, and, and I think you've said that pretty well. Um, and I, the, the results are in the photographs that come out of the experience. You know, I mean, my mother was a, was a, she was very involved in the church and she died when I was, I was like 12 years old. But I think, and she, I think she knew I was going to get involved with some things at some time in the future um, that has a, a religious kind of thing going on. I don't even think of it that way. I think it was something I'm supposed to do. I've had my own conversations with God, particularly on the battlefield, <laughs> you no. Know? Like if you, don't, if you don't, if you don't have an ego that's getting in the way of stuff. If it's getting in the way because you're trying to be a uh, thing, it's uh, you know. I, I said that I, I would take up. Much reading on so many different things before I ever picked up a camera, you know, and and it's uh, and then working at the hospital was a big, um, you know, a big thing on and looking how people are going through all kinds of things you know and and you you don't want to i mean you feel for them you feel for their families you know and it, what it is it's like you become a doctor in the world some ways so i didn't expect that you know i didn't realize i was going to be traveling all over the place that never entered my mind i admired the people whose work i saw but i never imagined that i'd be able to do that you know and so uh, mm -hmm. I, so the, the world is your some people say, oh, the world is your oyster. No, the world is your problem to deal with and to deal with making, um, you're capturing history, you're capturing life. And you want to be able to, uh, hopefully people understand that there are other ways, but there's some good ways or to believe in yourself, believe in the family. And, and you know, the evil that comes out, you know, the only way you can fight that is by showing what's going on, honestly. And so that if you That's can right. do that, you know, if you can do that, then you can you can sleep. I, even though I don't sleep anyway too much, but it's uh, it's something. It's uh, it's it's stimulating all the time. The fact that you can maybe connect with people. I met so many interesting people, and I've been able to do some things at the right time that helped. You know, and uh, documenting. Like I have some personal things that I really pay attention to, like the Lost Boys. That's that's one thing that's uh, important. It's, and they're always in my mind. Always in my net, not just looking at the pictures. And there's other people that like in, in Lebanon and in China and uh, Korea and, and Europe and things you meet. So the world is uh, the place for working in. The world, and we say things with our work that I can see, I can see people just enjoying the work that you're doing because it, it touches something. And I and I do a lot of things that that that, uh, that are hard to, to deal with for myself, which means you give This earth, my my body will still be telling my my, my <laughs> hey, come on, give it a break now. You can relax, you know, but you can never relax. It's it's, it's a joyful thing when you do things. So you say you make people happy, you know. You it doesn't get better than that. There's so many stories, so many places that you can go and and add something to their life. You know, that's the whole deal. Yeah, well, thank you. And with that, I, I really just want to thank you, Eli, and thank you, Jamel, again, for sharing this space with me. I feel very privileged to have participated in this conversation with the both of you, you know, particularly with you as two great artists who have both touched and healed the lives of so many people. So thank you again for your words and for your imagery and continue to press on. Bless you. Thank you. And I thank you and I thank everybody for tuning in. Thank you, Eli, for agreeing to this conversation. Yes. yes. Again, you have been a great inspiration to me. I want to continue because I have so many questions that I want to ask you about your experience in wartime. So I, I thank everybody for this time. This has truly been a, a great day for me. Definitely a great day for me, too. <laughs> you never say anything in the most come on your meetings, with, but you listen carefully. I see, I watch you. I watch you silently. So <laughs> I mean, it's like, I'm trying to learn. So, you know, I was taught just to listen and just take note of everything. You know, when the time is right, and the time was right right now to have this conversation with you. 
Right, right, absolutely. And hopefully I have a show up in New York as well. My show is going to open on, on, on Tuesday. It's called Eyes of the, of the, of the Streets. So if mm. you come to New York, I would I love to give you a personal tour of that exhibition. One of the most important shows outside of Peace of the Queen this uh-huh. year. All right. <laughs> and that's at the Bronx absolutely. Museum. I hold you at. I hold you at. Thank you, sir, for okay. doing such a great job here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and and one last word, you know, Jamel just mentioned his show in yeah. New York. So those of you that are in Austin, please do come to the Carver to see the Peace of the Queen retrospective. It's an amazing show. And um, just thank you again to everyone and have a great night. God bless. Okay. All right. Be well. Thank you. <laughs>